The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are mine and the guest hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of my employer, the Walt Disney Company. And now, enjoy the show. Welcome to Movies Unhacked, where we explore movies and the technology depicted in them. My name is Scott Croco. I'm joined by Mike Young. We're going to unhack The Conversation from 1974, starring Gene Hackman and directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Hello, Mike. How are you? Good. How's it going? Good. You're laughing at my intro. I can see you. <laughs> That's fine. Um, all right. So how many times have you seen this movie, Mike? Um... This might be my third time, two to three times, but I think I've seen it three times. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah. I think I saw it the first time in high school, maybe, and the second time in college, and then this was the third time watching it for this. You know what? Twice, now that I think about it. Okay. It was You recommended it to me, actually, a few years ago, and I watched it then, and I enjoyed it, and then, uh, yeah, I just watched it couple hours ago right francis ford coppola wrote and directed this movie and the at the time that he made this it's a critical period in coppola's career in the 1970s he made a total of four movies one of them was the godfather one of them was the godfather 2 one of them was apocalypse now and the fourth one was this one the conversation he wrote this movie before he made the Godfather movies. He wrote it in uh, 1966, and he wanted to get it made, but he couldn't get the studio to back him until after the success of The Godfather, and Paramount agreed to let him make it with the promise of Godfather 2 on the horizon. And then in 1974, this movie came out, The Conversation, and Godfather 2 came out, and both of them were nominated for Academy Awards for Best Picture. And that makes Francis Ford Coppola one of only 10 filmmakers to have two films nominated for the Best Picture Oscar in the same year. Some of the other filmmakers who have also had two films nominated the same year are guys like John Ford, Alfred Hitchcock, Victor Fleming, and Steven Soderbergh, guys you've probably heard of. Me? Yeah. <laughs> all, right, let's, all right, let's cut cut for a second yeah who else would i be talking to uh, yeah i know but I, am i supposed to be like reflexively like uh you know am i supposed to be punctuating so coppola was also nominated for best screenplay at the academy awards and this film the conversation won the palm d'or at the 1974 Cannes film festival and Coppola says that the conversation is one of his uh, favorites of his own movies that he's made. Yep. Gene Hackman is the star, and it's really, I think he's probably in every scene. Uh, this movie's all about his character. And in 2006, Premiere Magazine ranked his performance number 37 of the 100 greatest performances. And Hackman also has said that this is one of his favorite movies of the movies that he's made. And there's another guy who's important to this movie. His name is Martin Kaiser. I, I hope I pronounced that right. He was the technical advisor on this film. And uh, I think we'll talk more about him later. I'm going to go through the story real quick. And a spoiler warning. Anything that happens in this movie is open for discussion. So if you don't want to be spoiled by anything in the conversation, go and watch it and then come back. The movie opens with Harry Call, played by Gene Hackman, and his team of surveillance experts trying to record a conversation. I think they're in Union Square in San Francisco, and one of the people that they're recording is played by Cindy Williams from Laverne and Shirley fame. Later, we see Harry in the lab. He's editing the tapes together from the recordings that they got. He puts a package together to deliver to, quote, the director, who is the person who hired him, and he goes to deliver it to get his money, but the director isn't there. Instead, Harrison Ford is there, who is the director's assistant. 
Harry won't leave the tapes with anybody but the director, so he takes the tapes back, he gives the money back to Harrison Ford, and he leaves. On his way out of the building, though, he sees Cindy Williams and the gentleman that she was in conversation with in the building. This ramps up his curiosity, so he goes back to edit the tapes some more. And he's trying to get at this one critical piece of dialogue. It's, it's hard to get because they're talking right next to a band that's playing in the uh, square. But he finally figures it out, and the quote is, he'd kill us if he got the chance. Then the movie kind of goes into a sidetrack where they go to a surveillance technology convention and have kind of an after party. At the end of the after party, he has a woman stay with him. And when he wakes up in the morning, the woman is gone and his tapes are stolen. But the tapes were stolen by someone who took them to the director. So Harry goes to the director, he gets paid, but he's still very uneasy about this whole situation. He believes that somebody's going to get hurt. So he remembers from listening to the tapes that there's something going to go down at a hotel room. So he goes to that hotel, gets the room right next door to the room that he heard about. He eavesdrops on that room and thinks he hears slash sees a murder. The way the film's edited, it's a little murky as to what exactly he sees and hears. The next day, he goes to see the director again, and he's expecting that Cindy Williams had been murdered, but he sees her alive, sitting inside of a car. And then he sees a newspaper that says the director is dead. And then he puts it all together in his head that it seems that Cindy Williams and the gentleman from the conversation at the beginning conspired to kill the director. Cindy Williams is the director's wife, and she inherits the company and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Harry goes home. He gets a phone call that sounds to me like Harrison Ford, and he says, we know that you know. And then they play a recording of him in his own apartment from a few minutes earlier. This drives him insane. He's ripping up his apartment right down to the floorboards, and that's how the movie ends. So, Mike... What did you think of this movie? Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, even though I didn't really quite understand all of it. Uh, I still uh, like this movie a lot. Yeah, I like it too. I think this is what people mean when they call something a character study, that that's what this movie is. You follow this one Gene Hackman character around for the whole movie, and you're really, you know, you're really getting into the psyche of him and his profession and his paranoia and all of that. And uh, it works pretty well. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's even though it's it's called the conversation, it's really so much more about what you were just talking about than the conversation itself that they're studying in the movie. They spend very little time on that compared to just studying Gene Hackman and all these different roles in his life and kind of breaking down emotionally and and just you know he's middle aged and doesn't it's not a, like a very happy picture that you get of his life. Yeah, no, he doesn't seem like a happy person. I think by today's standards, this movie would probably be described as slow in the way that it unfolds. There's that opening shot that plays over the credits, and it slowly zooms down into the square and focuses on that mime as he follows people around. And you don't even really know what's going on exactly. You start to put the pieces together that, oh, these... This group of guys are recording the conversation of this couple. It doesn't bang you over the head with what they're doing. It just shows you what they're doing, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, I liked that. It was a nice wide open establishing shot. And then it slowly narrows in to the conversation. And and uh, it becomes a much more closed, kind of more paranoid shot as it zooms in. So it kind of goes through this transition where everything looks like it's public and open to suddenly, you know, you're in this weird surveillance kind of footage. I, I thought that was a great shot. Yeah. So the character of Harry Call, played by Gene Hackman, they go to some lengths to really portray him as a, a paranoid and private and careful person. For example, when he goes to his apartment, he unlocks three different locks with three different keys from a key ring that looks like it has about 20 keys on it. he When he goes inside, there's a birthday gift on the floor, and he's upset that it's there. He calls his landlady and asks her how did she get it into his apartment. He's quite upset that she has a, a key to get in. He tells people that he doesn't have a telephone, 
even though he clearly does. We see him use it a number of times in his apartment. Yeah. His super long cord. Yeah. <laughs> yep. His girlfriend, played by Terry Garr, he even tells her that he doesn't have a telephone. But he does have a phone. He keeps it in a drawer. So, yeah, he has a super long cord, and he keeps it in that drawer, which, was that a thing? I, I don't remember. Did people put phones in drawers, or was it just him? You see it in... Uh... Older movies, but yeah, I mean, in the 70s, outside of James Bond villains, you don't yeah. really see it. He says he builds all of his own equipment at one point in the movie, which again, I assume is because he wouldn't trust anybody else's equipment. They also show him as being a religious man, and he seems to have some guilt about a prior job that he worked where some people died. There's a lot of that religious mm -hmm. guilt throughout the whole movie. It reminded me of kind of a lot of uh, Mean Streets in, in parts with Harvey Keitel freaking out about being religious. And when you mentioned that it was written earlier, that kind of makes sense now because it, in a lot of ways it, the, the pacing and, and, and the themes in this movie are much more kind of in line with a late 60s kind of movie than something you'd typically see in 74, even for something like uh, coming out of like, you know, art house movies or you know, personal projects mm -hmm. like this. There's another character in this movie, Stan. He's uh, Harry Call's partner. Early in the movie, they show him, they have this surveillance van that they're hanging out in. And uh, the surveillance van has these windows that look like mirrors from the outside, but they're windows on the inside. And these two girls come up, they're putting on their lipstick and their makeup. This guy starts taking photographs of them from inside the van. Things are looser, you know. It was a... <laughs> That's why vans have that reputation. Yeah, no kidding. Guys like Stan. There really is like a crew of people in there recording and taking pictures. Yeah, it's it's everything, you know, that you want to avoid typically in a van. Absolutely. And then later, Stan has an argument with Harry and switches to work for a competitor like the same day. What's up with that? It, the whole industry seems, the way that it's portrayed in this movie is just this very, like, dark, closely knit circle of, like, maybe, like, you know, under a hundred guys nationwide <laughs> who all hate their jobs and are alcoholics and lonely. I mean, you know. <laughs> yep. So, so yeah, the, everything just seems to be like everyone's just kind of, like, on the edge of, you know, just had it. I, I don't know. For some reason, that seems like doesn't surprise me that they're shifting around like that. They do know how to party, though, those guys. They, after that convention, they gathered up some women. They got into a car, had like a mini car chase. Yeah, who are those guys in the other car? Was Were they relevant to anything else in the movie, or was that just for that scene? I, 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 I lost track of who those guys were, and that is a, uh, like a charger or something. Yeah, as far as I could tell, it was just that scene. I don't think they showed up anywhere else. Um. Did you notice what their beer of choice was at their little after party? I did not. They were drinking Miller. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that's a good that's a good party. Yeah. Wait, we we you know what? We need to back up. I mean, we can't talk about the after party without addressing the conference itself. I mean, that was an incredible array of images. <laughs> Although I don't know that might cross over into the technology department heavily though. That's part of it. Yeah, I think I would save that actually for the technology part. Okay. It's a great sequence in the film. We should definitely talk okay. about it. Okay. All right. So, all right, then, yeah, I'll skip it for now. Okay. Although, yeah, at this little party they have, he, he brings them all to his shop, to his lab. And I didn't understand why he would do that. You're bringing your competitors into your lab where everybody's drinking and you're being distracted by women and all this. That doesn't seem like a very smart move. Yeah, especially when the whole scene turns into him being asked about his work and why would you expect anything different for the exact reasons that you just laid out i mean he brings him back to his workplace right and and so it's a big showdown about where he has to you know hold on to his secrets for this case that he worked on or not and that's you know kind of when the whole party goes serious and sour you know is over that topic yep could have been avoided you know it's a bunch of guys drinking you know domestic beer in a dark warehouse you know it's it's not like a <laughs> most festive scene no it's not 
But they were having fun, Mike. That's all that matters. Yeah. But but they start fighting and crying towards the end. I mean, what does it take? Like, under a half hour, really. So. Yeah. That guy who's calling him out in the party looks kind of like a cross between Higgins and um, from uh, Magnum P.I. and Dennis France. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? The, the guy who's, like, hounding him. Yep. Yeah. He definitely does. Yeah. Um, also notable, I thought, is that there's nudity in this movie at the at the end of that party scene, and this is a PG movie. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Even up through uh, about 74, right? I think the latest I can think of would be uh, Clash of the Titans had nudity. Oh. Right? Right. 1980 or 1981, something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if, if that's the crossover with the uh, Walmart distribution or there was some particular chain distribution that would not carry things without certain ratings, and that's when it kind of made a jump. But I don't have enough facts on that really for it to be something that someone should listen to as a downloadable recording. <laughs> yeah, the only thing with that... Uh, nude scene was it concluded with watching gene hackman get his ear licked <laughs> do you remember that yeah yeah that that i could have gone with that getting cut a couple seconds earlier um but it was yeah other than that uh, i found that scene very entertaining mm -hmm. um so that dream sequence he has yes it seems like uh, it's it starts off in this kind of uh, almost uh, like weird Hitchcock meets Jess Franco, like lots of fog and distance between the two people talking. And then towards the end of it, it seems like it's definitely a bunch of cuts of just like one liners. He's just thrown at the camera that eight out of like 35 they used. You know, that looks good. I mean, it, it seemed like it was just improv riffing and like a lot, but like being done through like an echo box, you know? Yep. So it was, it was an awkward scene because it kind of went on maybe about a minute longer. But like you said, the pacing in the movie is a little more stretched out than, uh, than, than modern standards. I think that's a scene that I could have done without. Like you didn't need the ear licking. I didn't really need the the weird dream sequence as soon as it started i knew that it wasn't going to be relevant really to the to the overall plot and story of the movie it uh it didn't work for me well as far as scenes that move the story forward there's very few i guess that's true because it's like we said it's mostly a character study yeah i mean minute to minute it's yeah exactly it's it's a lot of open shots yeah <laughs> I really like that um, that fight scene that they have on the stairwell uh, towards the end. Oh yeah, and Gene Hackman tries to rush the building, but like it's very handily dismissed. And then like he's just like too, he's like really tired, and he tries to go back for that second like punch, and he's just, he's just like, all right, and like just turns around and walks away. <laughs> I thought that was a great scene. Yeah, that was a good little fight. Yeah, I enjoyed that. That um. Yeah, that one part when he suddenly remembers and they've got that one like super loud shrill synth note that kicks in when he suddenly remembers the murder and it cuts to like that crazy scene with all the blood in the shower and stuff. Yeah. That scared the shit out of me. Like that <laughs> that made me jump. Like I was I was mostly like kind of lulled by just how nice the movie looked and then all of a sudden it got really like kind of crazy for a second there. It was a good movie. I I, th I like the way it's shot and everything like that. I thought it looked great, sounded great, great performances. There's that key line that he spends some time trying to extract from the audio, which is he'd kill us if he got the chance. And that comes back multiple times in the movie where Harry gets a new piece of information and then they kind of play back that line again. And in the context of that new information, it has a different meaning. And that they do that a couple of times in the movie. So it's hard to tell 
exactly what that statement means. He'd kill us if he got the chance. Because at certain times it sounds like they're scared of him, like he will kill us if he gets the chance. And then at other times it sounds like they're justifying their own actions, like he'd kill us if he got the chance. It was very tricky trying to figure out what that statement meant. And that was a big part of the mystery that Harry was trying to figure out. It seemed like the film was more like trying to convey his state of mind of just all these scattered details and images and experiences, you know, mm -hmm. culminating in, yep. in the end of the movie, more so than a, than a deductive, you know, traditional investigation. Yep. So at the end, when he's kind of solved the mystery, at least in his own head as to what happened, he goes home. And he's playing the saxophone, which is something we didn't get to. He loves to play the saxophone in his apartment. That's like his one, probably his prized possession is his saxophone. Yeah. Yeah, Gene Hackman plays a mean sax. Yeah, he does. Uh, neighbors must love that. <laughs> like, can you imagine living in an apartment building with someone playing like a gigantic saxophone all the time? Well, in San Francisco, I'm sure they had good uh, soundproofing. <laughs> right. The phone rings. He goes to pick it up. There's nobody there, so he hangs up. Phone rings again. He answers. And the person on the phone says, they know that he knows, and they'll be listening. And then they play a recording of Harry playing the sax from just a few minutes earlier. Yep. He doesn't like this at all because he's the guy who surveils other people. Yeah. Is that a word? Yeah. Surveils? Absolutely. Okay, good. No, and and this is his space that he used to, you know, come home to and hang out in his underwear and talk on the phone like it's no big deal. That's right. It's his, uh, you know, his safe space. Did we, did, did we talk about that? How, like, within the first five minutes, it's like him just stripping down to his underwear and talking on the phone? No. <laughs> like, because like, that really does establish the, exactly like you said, it's like the doors are locked, you know, yep. total privacy. Which turns it to be a, you know, turns out to not be true. Right. So he's freaking out, thinking that there's a bug in his apartment. He's taking apart electrical items. He's searching through his statues. He's taking his blinds off the windows and looking through those. He's, you know, taking apart light fixtures and telephones, um, paintings, door frames, like all of it. He's ripping up the floorboards uh, from his hardwood floor. There's one thing he doesn't touch, though which is the Virgin Mary statue on his shelf. Yeah. At least at first he doesn't touch it, but then he goes back for a second round and he smashes the hell out of it and there's nothing inside of it. Basically, he rips up his entire apartment. And then checks the phone. Right. Did you notice that? He checks the phone way late in the sequence. You'd think that'd be like one of the first things, if not the first. <laughs> but nothing was in there, so to the point, you know, maybe the whole point was an amateur would never even put something right in the phone. So, yeah, he's demolished his apartment. I think the implication there is that he does not find the bug. But he's sitting there. He's playing his saxophone again. His life and his apartment are stripped bare. And then we have this shot that looks like a security cam. It's on him, and then it pans to the right and pans to the left and then pans to the right again, just like a 7-Eleven security camera. And that shot was mirrored in the first shot in his apartment at the very beginning of the movie, where when he comes in and it's right before he's, you know, getting into his underwear, it's a static shot of just his apartment. He walks across the camera and the camera kind of waits a beat before it follows him and then pans left over to him, but it's the same type of shot. Interesting. That was a nice open and close matching shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't catch that. Excellent. Do you think this movie has a message? So what is it trying to say? Um, I I think it's, it's 1974, so you got to figure America. They're all concerned with tapes, and tapes is a marketable thing, and you can make a movie about a you know a tape thriller theoretically. Probably in the context of Watergate, and it's going through themes of you know privacy, public space, and privacy, because a lot of the shots are just about you know people trying to unwind or do things in private and then finding out that you know they're constantly being surveilled um coppola had some comments on that topic 
this film was released in theaters just a few months before Richard Nixon resigned. Oh, wow, nice. So Coppola felt that audiences interpreted the film to be a reaction to the Watergate scandal. Nice. But he points out that the script was completed in the mid-60s before the Nixon administration even existed. Man. Well, it just re that totally destroys my entire point. And filming completed months before the uh, kind of the revelatory Watergate stories broke in the press. Um, it's interesting that he made those comments, though, because, you know, some filmmakers would take credit for that. Like, yes, I'm very topical. And this came out in the middle of the Watergate scandal because, you know, that's the kind of guy I am. But wow. Yeah, I know. That's interesting, man. I, I definitely thought it was entirely within that whole context. So mm -hmm. that's bizarre. Apparently it was just coincidence. When did uh, Blow Up come out? Blow Up. Oh, right. 1966, which was part of the inspiration for this movie. That's why he wrote okay. this script in 1966. Right. It was like the reel to reel cassette version of Blow Up. Yeah, exactly. All right, Mike, you ready to move on to discuss the technology in this movie? Definitely. All right. Based in San Francisco, which seems appropriate considering the technology industry that grew up here. I say here because I'm outside of San Francisco. Mike, where are you again? Iowa or something? Where'd you move to? I'm in Chicago. <laughs> All right, so what should we talk about first? We can talk about Harry's equipment. He's got some pretty nice recording equipment. Uh, yeah. Most of which we see in the opening scene when they're trying to record that conversation, the conversation. Uh, they show one guy who's got a parabolic microphone stuck out of a window. Yeah. They've got another guy with a microphone in a shopping bag. They've got Gene Hackman walking around. I presumed he was bugged, like maybe it was in his coffee cup or something. I'm not sure. And they had another guy up on top of a roof with something that looked like a rifle. Um, most of this stuff is real equipment. The rifle looking device, though, I wasn't so sure about. I couldn't actually find an example of an audio listening device that looked like that. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and that, that shows up later in the movie, too, when they are having the after party at his shop. And he's showing it to one of his competitors, like, hey, this is the new thing. And, you know, that guy's like, well, let me take a look at it. And he's like, no, you don't get to see this. So I'm wondering if that one device was maybe a little bit of a movie invention or if I just couldn't figure out what it was exactly. Yeah, it's probably more of a movie invention would be my guess because the uh, gigantic sonar dish style um, microphones that you see like along the sides at NFL games are still these gigantic sonar dish things, kind of like what you saw the guy in the window using. Right. But you don't see uh, people using anything like the, the rifle style, really. There is a type of device called, I think it's called a laser microphone. And these work, these are, I think these are newer though. Well, they, they might've been around at this time. But the way they work is they shoot a laser onto an object that will pick up vibrations and usually in a room of some sort. So like if you and I are in a room, someone's trying to listen to us, they would shoot the laser onto like a picture frame or something like this. And the picture frame would vibrate with the sounds of us talking. And that vibration can be recorded and then later kind of manipulated into sound, like reverse engineered into sound. So right. maybe it could have been something like that, except I don't know how that would work out in the open. If you're, you know, in an open public square like that, and there's all kinds of people moving around and kids and dogs and mimes and music, what exactly would you shoot that at to try and pick up their conversation? I'm not sure. No, and in 1974, a laser wouldn't fit into something the size of a rifle either. Something that could project that far and have that kind of degree of accuracy, especially in broad daylight. Yeah. And, um, you know, all the other stuff in this movie, there's a lot of wiretaps and bugs that are implied. We don't see a lot of the detail of it. Like they don't show somebody actually, say, installing a bug into a phone, for example. So you don't get that up close look at it. But 
it's all implied in there. You do get to see Gene Hackman when he's in the hotel room um, next door to the people that he's trying to spy on. Kind of drills a little hole in the wall and run, I think runs a little corded mic through there to try and, and listen in and huddles under the sink in the bathroom while he's listening, which is kind of a great shot. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. It doesn't paint a pretty picture of <laughs> his life. Yeah. Today, though, a whole different story. Today, if somebody wants to eavesdrop on you, um, anything in your home or in your on your person that has a microphone in it and an and internet access is liable to be turned into an eavesdropping device. There's all kinds of things that you can read about in the news of people remotely turning on your you know, computer's video camera without you knowing or turning on your microphone on your phone without you knowing. All kinds of stuff today that Harry Call would be all over. Yeah. Another great piece of equipment Harry has is his van, which we mentioned earlier. Definitely. No, that whole uh, opening scene uh, where they're in the van, the technology on display there is classic genre surveillance van. You know, you've got two half-inch reel-to-reels running. You've got guys with gigantic headphones on who look like they've been up for, you know, ridiculous amount of time. And, you know, they seem to just be like like they've been there forever for some reason, even though it's, they're surveilling like a city park. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really good technology. I like the way that the things, everything looked used and heavily used, but it didn't imply that it was broken. It was just like, this is how these guys get the job done with this equipment that they just beat on all the time. And as opposed to, uh, something like CSI where, you know, you're just supposed to be like, oh my God, you know, there's fog and lasers around all this stuff. And, you know, their stuff was very like real and, and, uh relatable i thought right for the time period yeah yeah very workmanlike definitely yes harry also has a lot of cool equipment in his shop he's got you know i don't know countless reel-to-reel machines in there i think but um they put together a sequence where they show him editing the tapes early in the movie and he sets up he's got three different tapes and three different machines he kind of syncs them up to a starting point um, he has some sort of mixer that allows him to bump up or down each of the sources in the in the overall mix that he's listening to. He's able to rewind and, and forward all three tapes at the same time to kind of go back and forth and scrub through them. I thought that was really cool. And the the way that they shot that editing sequence is another example of the way that they don't make films anymore. Today, if you had a sequence like this, you would have another character looking over his shoulder and he would be talking to that character and he'd say, oh, yeah, I just put the tapes over here and this allows me to do this and that. And then I can, you know, cut it together like this. Right. He would explain it verbally. But this movie, that whole scene, there's no talking. It's just him doing the work. They're showing you what he's doing and you get, you know, you get a real clear picture of how he does it and what he's doing, which is great filmmaking. Definitely. Definitely. No, the, the, the sound and the pacing and the visuals on that whole sequence are fantastic. Yep. And, you know. Not that different from what I do, editing this show together. Got a couple of audio tracks. Got to sync those things up. Got to get the good bits and the bad bits cut out of there. It's all the same. Just electronic. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I know. It's like you're a, an information DJ. <laughs> mm-hmm. One thing I also <laughs> noticed in that was uh, when he's playing back the tapes and he's editing and he's he's dialing everything in it's very clearly audio being run through a vintage synthesizer and uh so i looked it up and uh sure enough it's this guy clark spangler who ran all the conversations through an arp 2600 which is also used for a lot of uh sci-fi movie sound effects um he's worked with lalo schifrin and uh, he also did some work on Neil Diamond's Jonathan Livingston Siegel album. So he's definitely got a library of work that, to be respected. Huh. Um, but yeah, it was very weird because it was, I was expecting like static or maybe just silence, but instead there's like all these psychedelic sounds that are the distortion and the sound and, and what he's doing there, which I thought was great you know I, I thoroughly enjoyed it but it was also very recognizable that it was a musical instrument i didn't know that 
and the overall sound of the film is pretty good. Some other equipment I noticed in this movie, there's that scene where they're all stuffed into the car together after the convention. This other sports car pulls up alongside them or cuts them off or whatever he does. And in the car where everybody's in, the one guy picks up a phone and I think calls the police to report this car. And the phone that he picks up, it looks like the same handset that you would see on like the phone on the president's desk. (laughs) <laughs> the same one, like the same one in Harry Call's apartment. Like it just looks like a generic phone. And I thought this was laughable when I saw it because it looked like somebody just took a phone, put it in the car and said, here, grab this, pretend like you're making a phone call, right? That's, but that's what they were like. Yeah, exactly. Until I researched it. I'd never really looked this up. And there were mobile radio telephones that looked just like that. So because I looked it up, I know now that the first mobile telephones were used by the military in the 40s. And by the 1960s, there were competing mobile telephone services. Um, The 1964 Motorola car phone used a plain black handset, just like the one in the movie. So I thought it was hilarious at first, but no, like that was real. That was actually what they were putting on these mobile phones. For sure. Yeah. They, uh, I mean, even in the, uh, the Vietnam movies, right? You always see them, those huge backpacks, but the end piece is always like a common household handset right but then that disappeared that at some point that stopped being the optimal way to hold uh, a communication device Mm -hmm. want to talk about this technology convention yes okay Uh, the trade show was was all around incredible like please please kick off the trade so set because it really deserves like an intro so um, wow, I wasn't prepared to give it a big introduction, but I'll do my best. Well, first of all, I'll just say technology conventions have not changed in 40 plus years. <laughs> it's still the same thing. You walk through a big warehouse like area, there's all kinds of booths set up, there's all kinds of dudes trying to pitch you or sell you on whatever their latest product is. So, yeah, so Gene Hackman goes in there. And he's just kind of walking around looking at, you know, the latest gadgetry and whatnot. Stuff like a Super 8 camera hidden inside of a clock, telephone surveillance devices, alarms for doors, safes, security video cameras, um, devices designed to be concealed under dashboards of cars, all good surveillance stuff. They've got it. Yeah, it was great. It was like walking through uh, Q's laboratory, but in the type of presentation more consistent with like lots of bad wood paneling and just they had that like dirty kind of convention floor feel but at the same time they had all this technology like that weird uh white and chrome spinning box did you see that thing in the background or any of those shots there (laughs) no i missed that one they had this weird prop it was next to the uh that gadget that the guy was trying to sell the uh was it the moran yeah. The Moran S15 Telephone Interceptor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one that he does his dog and pony show yes. to demonstrate how it works. Which I thought was also another thing. So they felt that they really had to, like, you know, show that even this was, you know, there was shysters in this business and that, you know, no one could really be trusted. And I thought that was an interesting, like, <laughs> why... Why did they go in that direction? Like, they really had to, like, show that this was a mixed bag, this entire industry that he's in. Yeah. And this Moran character, this is the guy I mentioned earlier that Stan, after having an argument with Harry, he switches to work for a competitor. It's this Moran guy who he goes to work for. And while Harry Call is a very unhappy person, Moran is like the sleazy version of the surveillance guy. By comparison, Harry is like the you know, upstanding citizen version of surveillance guy. (laughs) And Moran does that little demonstration of his product. And then he sees Harry call and, you know, wants to talk to him or whatever. And he gives him a free pen, sticks it in his pocket. Harry call looks down and stares at that pen for a good 10 seconds in his pocket. And it seems clear to me from that moment that he knows what was just put into his pocket, but he leaves it in there. He leaves it in there. 
and they go and have their whole after party, the pen's in his pocket the whole time. And then at like a critical point during the party, Moran breaks out a little tape recorder where he's been recording Harry's, you know, intimate conversation that he had with a woman over in the corner. Of course, this pisses Harry off. He kicks everybody out. That's the end of the party. But he knew what that pen was. You could tell by the way he stared at it. I'm not sure why he left it in his pocket. That's that's an amazing... I, I don't have a response to that, but that's an amazing point. So I, I would say just cut the edit there because <laughs> it's a really good point. Um, I would imagine that character sees something like that. And he's like, all these people are already back in the loft. My life's already half in the tank. I'm resigned to just like... I'll try to keep an eye on him to see if it uh if he's using it, you know. Right. Now, there's a lot of resignation throughout this entire movie on you know on on Gene Hackman's part like yeah. or yeah. actually and his partner who leaves him. Yeah. You know, they just seem like just such unhappy people, you know, isolated listening to these tapes and obsessing about the minutia, you know, so. Yep. So, one other note about the equipment is that a lot of the surveillance equipment was actually the same, the exact same, you know, models that were used by members of the Nixon administration when they were doing their spying. So yet another correlation between what was happening in real life and what happened in this movie. But again, Coppola just felt this was coincidental. Um, They had found all their equipment via research and their technical advisor, who I want to talk about. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, Marty Kaiser. So this guy became kind of a legend in the surveillance industry. He got started, coincidentally, around 1966 in the eavesdropping business. 1966 is a a banner year, I guess. We have Blowout in theaters. We had Francis Ford Coppola writing the script for this. We have this Marty Kaiser guy getting into the business. Anyway, he was one of those early guys who would build bugs that fit inside picture frames and fountain pens and staplers and, you know, baseball caps, whatever. Um, Telephones that could capture audio in the room after they were hung up. His clients included the FBI, CIA, DEA, Secret Service, uh, the military intelligence community, and foreign intelligence services. Like he, you know, he was a player. And he was the technical consultant on this movie. So I'm not surprised that the technology in it is all legit, as far as I could tell. Again, and this is what makes me wonder about that rifle-looking thing. You know, I couldn't figure out what it was, but that doesn't mean it didn't exist, necessarily. You know, like, maybe I should give them the benefit of the doubt, considering this guy's credentials. Yep. I mean, my point was that I hadn't seen it on uh, football. Right. So there's a lot of room to, you know, work there. (laughs) You know, the... There's a lot of things that, that we probably are not experts on. You know, I'm willing to say that I'm not a thorough expert on remote sound monitoring technology. Uh, that laser thing I'd never even heard of before, that thing you were talking about. I think the NFL is a great litmus test, though. You know, if they're using it, then you know it's legit. They are kind of next to the military as far as, you know, technology seems to break first, you know, for the military and then it goes to the NFL after that. Yeah. This technical advisor, Marty Kaiser, his story's not over yet. He consulted on this movie and had built up a nice business for himself. But then he was asked to testify in 1975 before the National Wiretap Commission. And he helped expose uh, what's called a cutout, which is an industry term where a front is used as a go-between between the FBI and the, uh, the source of a, an equipment maker to help hide the source from foreign powers. So if somebody were looking into it, they would see the FBI dealing with like, you know, Joe Blow Incorporated, not dealing with Marty Kaiser, you know, eavesdrop professional. So it, it adds kind of an abstract layer. But the problem with that is when you have a cutout, typically the prices get marked up by the cutout. So whatever your supplier is charging gets marked up some percentage and then that's what the FBI is paying. That can turn into a bit of an issue based on how much of a percentage is being marked up for obvious reasons. So after he testified, the FBI stopped using him. He 
lost a bunch of other federal contracts, which that's pretty predictable, I think, if you're going to testify to that effect against an FBI practice. I mean, I think you would expect to lose the FBI's business. But then a few years later, the FBI brought criminal charges and then civil charges against him for his role in an entirely different thing that happened. He was advising the Northwestern Bank for how to record using one-party consent with portable recorders and bugs in their offices. And they were being investigated by the FBI. So the FBI came in and some of their agents were recorded using these bugs. And it should have been all legal with this one-party consent, meaning, you know, one at least one person in the room knows that they're being recorded while the other parties don't. But the FBI brought criminal charges to Marty Kaiser over this, and he was found not guilty of the criminal charges. And then they brought civil charges because the FBI agents who were recorded felt that they were, you know, humiliated and et cetera, et cetera. And I could not find out what the result of the civil suit was. I searched around and could not find I couldn't even find if it was, you know, settled uh, privately or what happened exactly. So I don't know what the result of the civil suit was. Interesting. It could be, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that for the Internet, a lot of things kind of went undocumented probably. Yeah. I mean, this is a long time ago. When this movie was released... It made about $4.4 million, which is not a lot by today's standards or by 1974 standards. But its budget, according to the internet, was $1.6 million. So it at least made some money, it sounds like. In 1974, do you know what the number one grossing film was? 1974, uh, Godfather II. Godfather 2 was number 6. Hmm. It made 57 million. Herbie goes bananas. <laughs> That's a decent guess. I don't know if that came out in 1974. No, the number 1 box office movie was Blazing Saddles. Great movie. Yep. 119 million. And number 4, the same year was Young Frankenstein. Seriously. Mel Brooks? Yep. Mel Brooks cleaned up, huh? Good. He did. Young Frankenstein made $86 million. And Gene Wilder. Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder just uh, took over. That's great. Yeah, those are both killer classic comedy movies. Timeless. Yep. Um, the critics like this movie. You look up Rotten Tomatoes today, all the critics are at 98%. The top critics are at 100%. And the users are at 90%. So that's really good. That's a lot of high scores all around. This movie's been included on the A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die list, which that's kind of a dubious honor. A Thousand and One Movies? I mean, that's a lot of movies. I'd say it's definitely in there. Oh, well, it certainly is, but I mean, what, you know, I don't know what number it is. Right. Is it number 842? Yeah. I mean, Dead or Alive is probably in there, too. <laughs> I mean, A Thousand, like you said, that's, yeah. How many hours? I mean, you got to figure out just how many, like, that's years worth of movies. It's also included on Roger Ebert's Great Movies list. And it was selected for preservation in the Library of Congress's National Film Registry, which I think that's a pretty good honor. Did you watch it on Amazon Prime? No, I actually had the DVD. Oh, it was uh, blurry. Really? Which I thought was odd, given the, the the whole thematic, you know, dissecting a piece of media and all that. Hmm. Yeah, I had the DVD. Yeah. Um, Old-fashioned, you know, Netflix DVD delivery. Oh, nice. Was there uh, any, were there any uh, cool special features on that? There was one special feature that I was looking forward to because I thought maybe it would be some good insight for this episode. But it wasn't really. It was. It just showed Gene Hackman and Coppola on set working in a few scenes. So you got to see a little bit of Coppola giving direction to Hackman. Yeah. And them kind of discussing scenes. But it was very much the information that it that it gave was very much generic how to make a movie information. It wasn't specific to the film. 
Mm. So it wasn't all that helpful in terms of learning something about the conversation. Hmm. All right. You got any last thoughts? Uh, it's my favorite movie we've done so far. <laughs> okay. Good. It's my concluding joke. Scratch that one off the list. Everybody, thanks for listening. You can find us at moviesunhacked.com or Movies Unhacked on Twitter. We're also on Facebook. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Mike, where can they find you? Uh, if you want to uh, get in touch with me, I'm at uh, gasbag2000 on Twitter. All right. Thanks, Mike. You're the best. Ready? Yep. Welcome to Movies Unhacked. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> You were you were, you were recording your side, right? Yeah. All right, let's go. Ready? So, yeah, I am. Are you ready or not? Yeah, when I ask you if you're ready and you say yes, then that means I'll probably start talking. <laughs> All right. I assume that's BPA free I hear. Of course. I mean, you realize, you remember that you introduced me to that whole concept, and it's like huge now. I did? Yeah. Yeah, the Camelback water bottle that I was fascinated with. You explained it all to me. Uh-huh. You, this one? Is it the same one? Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have two of them. <laughs> nice. Yes. It's like my tracksuit. I just have my tracksuit, and I have my water bottle, and that's that's all I need. Oh, man, I had lots of great material here. <laughs> right. well, you got to use it then.